David Leonard is best known as one half of singing-songwriting duo All Sons and Daughters, and for penning some of the church's most tender worship songs, including Great Are You, Lord. After All Sons and Daughters celebrated their first Grammy nomination at the beginning of last year, the decade-old band officially disbanded, and David found himself in a desert of sorts, wandering through a concentrated period of professional and personal disappointments, resulting in an extended season of depression, and of heartache. Having caught a glimpse of light in the middle of his deep darkness, David began writing again, but for the first time in his career as a musician, he was writing songs for himself. These songs create the journey of his first solo recording called The Wait. In this thoughtfully honest interview, David delves into what it means to hang tight and hold on while lost in the dark. This is CCM Magazine's Features on Film. I'm your host, Andrew Greer. So something I learned about you, David, that I didn't know, and maybe this shows my ignorance, but I asked Chris, too, and he was like, I, I didn't know that, is that you've been part of three bands in your career, Jackson Waters, Need to Breathe, and of course, uh, the band we most know you for, All Sons and Daughters. Yeah. And now you're solo artist, so it's kind of like, will the real David stand up? Yeah. <laughs> Which one is it? So that history, I didn't know, I had no idea you had that history with so many bands that we have so much history. Yeah with where did you first begin kind of that trajectory of music that led you to where you are today man i mean i grew up in a house my dad was like a worship pastor mm -hmm. worship pastor college pastor youth pastor you know yeah that guy that we're all yeah. like uh -huh. um but I, you know i was constantly surrounded by music my grandma played piano and organ so i, I remember sitting on sundays she would come down she lived an hour and a half away but she would always come down on sundays for the most part really and she'd play organ on sundays and you know the old baptist church where they'd have the partitions around <laughs> yes. around the organs it's modesty uh, is oh that is that what it, that I was it's called a modesty rose oh. yeah so you don't i see i had no idea see too much that's <laughs> amazing uh so that for me as a kid sitting back there i would sit on the floor behind that thing and i'd draw and i'd have cokes and cookies and <laughs> but it was the coolest thing for me uh -huh. but i do remember at one point i was like all of a sudden i was realizing that she was creating and she was mm -hmm. making and so i remember sitting back there and, and just watching her and kind of falling in love with that and piano was never like the thing i never grew up playing it or mm -hmm. anything I, I didn't pick it up till later on but um music kind of kind of started intertwining in my life some friends started a band and they asked me if i wanted to come sing and i was way more into sports and hunting mm. southeast arkansas that's yeah, all you right, do. right yeah um but i remember going and they asked me to be a part of this night that they were doing and they asked if i would sing a jars of clay song uh and i remember sitting in english class and learning every lyric to the song and being terrified to get up there and sing it <laughs> what song is that uh what was it uh like a like a child dear god that uh -huh. what, what's the name of it uh, is it like I a child because they never really named it what the lyric that yeah. was in it the first line like was dear god uh-huh whatever <laughs> and then surround and me as i speak time, right dear i god. was dear god get surround me out of here <laughs> yeah yeah uh, but i remember after that i was hooked yeah like singing that one time and then all of a sudden i'm i'm headed down this path so yeah it's obvious that music is like kind of in your bones you know yeah. there's artists who create on all different levels and musicians who create on all different levels but uh, i think this was especially exemplified with beginning with all sons and daughters is your really giftedness not only as in the musical components of being able to create something for performance but as a producer and a mm. songwriter and i kind of want to paint this picture that i've heard you paint before of just a couple years ago when all sons and daughters really kind of at the pinnacle of what some people may think of in music success being nominated for a grammy being out in la and on the red carpet um but and I don't want to put words in your mouth, I want mm. you to tell me, but really internally, personally, so being at this peak career-wise, but personally being in a place of a lot of, would you say, doubt or even kind of dying inside? Yeah, I mean, it was a crazy season because uh, at that point we, we were deciding to take a complete year off. So at that point, you know, most people when they take a year off, you're, you're like going, okay, hey, this might not happen ever again, sure. especially in the music industry. It's like you never know what's mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. So there was that integral struggle with myself of going, okay, if this goes away, who am I? Mm -hmm. Because I have been a part of so many things. Some have worked, some have not. So now I'm a part of something that is working. And if that goes away, now I'm back to the 
-hmm. God that's a part of something that doesn't work anymore, you know? Well, in that contrast of uh, here we are experiencing some level of success, and I would say very known, yeah. you know, at, at a height of popularity too, yeah. and then taking a year off. So it, there was all that, and then at the same time, me and my wife were trying to have, we tried to have another child for like four years to that point. Ended up getting pregnant, had a miscarriage right right around the same time. And uh, so there was tons of, you know, doubt and hurt through all of that season. And then the identity pieces. So it was a snowball effect of emotions that was happening mm -hmm. on mine and my wife's life at that point. But, yeah, it was, uh, it's, it's a season that I'll always carry with me for a long time. How did you begin to transition in that season? I know you took a road trip. I want to hear about yeah. the road trip. So you're out in L.A. for the Grammys, and you drove solo back to Nashville, cross I country. Did, essentially. I did. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't just a road trip. No, I mean, I, th I think I wanted to have, um, in the midst of all the chaos, I wanted to have a moment where I could have a little bit of peace. And I knew if I could get alone in a car, especially for 30 hours, <laughs> I could possibly find some of that. And um, I remember sitting out and, you know, I, I wanted to have moments on this trip where I truly felt like God could speak to me. And most most everybody, when I would talk to them about the trip, everybody would go, you have to go to the Grand Canyon. You always see God in the Grand Canyon. It's not this grand cathedral that, you know, it's it's hard to miss him there. And so that's where I was headed. I was headed to the Grand Canyon. And it took me like four hours to get out of L.A. because I chose to leave L.A. at the wrong time. And I got it's out of L.A. almost any time. It's, it's true. <laughs> Except for at 5.20 in the morning, which was perfect the last time I did. Um, but I remember leaving out, and it took me four hours to get out of L.A. I finally get to the Mojave Desert, and it's pitch black. And I, um, I remember completely completely feeling alone, realizing that I had just taken all of my closest friends and family, I'd put them on a plane, I'd send them a thousand miles away, and uh, and I was completely by myself. And if anything happened to me out there that no one could get to me quick enough. <laughs> um, so I just remember this anxiety just kind of building up in me. And I remember as, if, as I was heading out, I could start to see the her like the mountain range and I could see the this light kind of start to shine over the horizon and I thought I was coming into a town but realized that I was not and all of a sudden the light began to get brighter and brighter and the moon broke the horizon and it was the biggest thing that I'd ever seen and it immediately felt like God threw on a flashlight and just said I see you and for me in that moment like that was all I needed I didn't need some voice I didn't need him to lay out the rest of my life. I, I just needed him to acknowledge me. Because I think in that season, I I totally felt unacknowledged. And if I could get the creator of the world to acknowledge me, then I felt like I was okay. And um, I had that, and it was just mind-blowing. And I remember getting to the Grand Canyon the next day, and it was really beautiful. <laughs> but it was nothing like the moment in the desert. And, you know, we talk about, you know, we go see God and, and, and we have these moments with, with Him in church and all these things mm -hmm. where we expect to see Him. And most of the time they're, they're really sweet and they're, they're really, thing, really beautiful, but we tend to skip over these desert moments that we have. But it's in those moments, the majority of the time, that we, we tend to carry those things with us for a long time. The crazy thing is I, I just did this trip back and I took my family with me <laughs> and we drove out mm. to California this time and this time I drove through the desert during the day <laughs> and uh, I found something really interesting when I was driving through during the day and because for me visually as I'm driving through the desert at night I, all I think about is just complete desert mm -hmm. sand nothingness and I drove through during the day and it was green and it was filled with life mm -hmm. and it was like how many times in, uh, that we cross over these moments and we don't realize if we just turned on the lights mm -hmm. that there's actually life mm -hmm. in these moments. And I just felt like it was another gift that God gave me walking through that one. And so, That's a little full circle. Yeah, it was it, kind of crazy. It's interesting that your friends were like, go to the Grand Canyon, you'll see God. But what you were really, sounds like what you were really 
interested in was God seeing you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's what happened. Do you, do you feel like that moment, I mean, just uh, take away the kind of drama of it and the, yeah. the specificity of it, but do you feel like that was maybe the first time that you really felt seen by God? Hmm. I mean, I think there's definitely moments in my life that I can definitely look back and go, okay, okay, this was seriously a moment that, that I felt acknowledged, but uh, there, there's never going to be another one, or there hasn't been mm -hmm. one to that point. Who knows what will happen at this point. Um, but yeah, there definitely hasn't been anything like that. Yeah. Talk about this journey of that you and your wife and your family yeah. are on to, um, to get pregnant and we know that's a, a very relatable journey for a lot of people, now, and probably for a long time, but something yeah. we express more now than ever. Did Do you ever think through that kind of, um, do you ever think like the pursuit to get pregnant, is this going to cost us our relationship? Is this going to cost me my mental sanity? Is this yeah. going to cost me my emotional health? We don't, we talk about the pursuit to get pregnant um, I think more openly now, yeah. but I don't know if we talk about our personal experience of, of were you worried at all, you know, about what will this cost me, the pursuit to get Yeah, pregnant. I mean, when you're talking about four years of uh, every month being hopeful and then crushed mm -hmm. at the same time, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about a, and a crazy amount of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, we both became numb to the entire thing. I think the first couple of years we were still hopeful. Um, but after that, it, it just became a routine of, well, I guess we just have to continue trying. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, at the end of it, we got to the, the point of we weren't, we just didn't even care anymore. Like it, we weren't trying. It was like, sure. this doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. I mean, when you say numb, did it produce numbness? In your relationship with each other? Or? Oh, yeah, across the board. Mm -hmm. yeah. And with God, I would assume, too, yeah, yeah. from a spiritual level. Relationships with others, everything. Huh. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me because I think, I don't think you guys are alone in that feeling. Yeah. Um, I, I heard the word bitterness was used in reference uh, somewhere I read or something mm. in reference to that season of, of your life. Um, is that true? Does that was bitterness an aspect that you began to experience? And if it was, how did you begin to transition into um, acceptance and potentially some element of surrender? That's a good question. Uh, or did you? Yeah, I mean, I think I think for sure um, we were just mad. I think I think bitterness is is um, it's a good word, but I, I think we we're more mad than we were bitter mm. <laughs> about the whole thing because mm -hmm. it it just uh, it festered for so long that it 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 created so much tension in our lives that um, that we were just done mm -hmm. feeling those things, and I you know I I think I think there were. I think there were moments where we, where we had, really beautiful conversations in it. Like my wife was, obviously she was carrying the brunt of all of this, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we had some really beautiful moments where we were able to to be really honest and like there were some, there were some times that, um, and one one in particular that we will always remember. Is we were sitting at dinner one night. We we're at this Mexican restaurant across the street from my house, and we're sitting there with our. We have a seven-year-old daughter, um, and she's awesome. And I rem we remember sitting there, and uh, and I don't think we were talking much. I think it was pretty quiet. And she just asked. She said, "Hey, I I want to pray for the baby thing." And I was like, "Okay." And she just said this quick little prayer, and like, it was probably the most meaningful thing that had been done for us the entire journey. And um, 
And I just remember leaving that night and sitting with my wife, and it was like all of a sudden we'd been given, given hope again. And it was just like little moments like that that, that happened throughout that um, made us keep thinking that there was a purpose in all of this. You know, and I think that's the big thing is like when you when you lose purpose, when you have no reason to continue on, then that like that's truly when death happens. Mm -hmm. But when you still have something to hope for, there's still something like that, then then you know I think it's it's worth fighting for and worth moving for. And something to remind you that hope is still yeah. alive. Something as simple as your daughter's request yeah. to pray, uh, her seeing you. Yeah. can be an element of God seeing. Well, and I think, she, I mean, she's a perfect example of someone who can see through the facade of all of this. She was seeing everything, the good, the bad, mm -hmm. all of it, and she felt compelled to pray, which for me I felt was very interesting and beautiful at the same time. Mm -hmm. So from the ashes of this season, you know, there is this flame, and I think the record, the weight is... Uh, was kind of maybe a surprising um, spark from this. Did you did you see around the bend? I mean, were you, were you thinking about music? Obviously, you were thinking about what's next with all sons and daughters taking a break. But did you see a solo David Leonard? You know, uh, <laughs> around the bend and and this record even in particular. No, I mean all the um, the majority of these songs were being written for other people. Mm -hmm. So during that season, taking the year off in 2017, I just started writing. And me and two of my best friends, Seth Talley and Brad King, we created this production company together and we started producing records. And so, like, mentally, that's where my brain was. Like, it was just creating for everyone else. Mm -hmm. So we would take these writing sessions and I would write. And obviously, you know, I'm, I, I've learned that you have to write what you know. And uh, so a lot of what was coming out of me were songs that pertain to what we were walking through. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them made them rec made to re made on records sure. and some didn't. Sure. And, um, but you're thinking I'm just in a writer's room right yeah, now. You're not thinking not, yeah. there was not no creating pressure. a project. There was no yeah. pressure. I was talking. I was talking to a guy last night, and I, I explained that, and he was like, "That I don't even understand." That. Yeah, right. I was <laughs> like, "Well, I don't need that. that before, I don't either, right? because yeah. I'd never experienced that before." Uh, yeah. You know, always creating this record is this grand in pressure. game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's like this pressure that you have to put on yourself. Mm -hmm. We had written the majority of it, and it was, and we had the songs. We were picking them, and we had like a a week or two before we were going to track, and so. That was the first time where I said, hey, let's grab a couple of different people and let's write, particularly for this one. Mm -hmm. And only one song out of that thing made the record. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It's, it's just interesting. In a way, does that, does that create a more satisfying project for you? Uh, I, I think it created a less pressure yeah. situation for me. Yeah. Um, Which is more enjoyable in some way. Way more enjoyable. Yeah. 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 And I mean, we we you know we did it all here. We we did it together as a yeah. team and a family, and yeah. so it just felt like responding. It didn't feel like work. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's this quote I read. And this is you speaking, mm. I think. Um, I don't know if this is a Sunday record. Maybe it's more of a weekday record. But it is for worshipers. It's for everyone who's been in that desert place looking for signs of life, more of God in the everyday. Do you feel like there's more signs of life, more signs of God in every day, all day, than perhaps in kind of the heightened experience of a church service or uh, a worship, you know, event? Yeah, I mean, I think we're just not aware of them. I think on Sundays we, we're paying attention to it. Hmm. Because like God's at the front of our minds. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we're going there on Sunday. This mm -hmm. is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. But we probably interact with him way more during the week than we ever mm -hmm. do on Sunday. And we're just not aware of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I, I said that about the weekday thing, it was like we wanted to make a record that allowed people to get from, and we say it, point A to point A. Mm -hmm. It's like <laughs> Sunday to Sunday. It's like we're trying to get get you there uh -huh. and there's so much stuff that happens in between you know 
the guy we were with, Tim Timmons, mm -hmm. talks about the the ten thousand minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's this time that we have outside of church that we continue to forget about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that's that was the kind of idea with this of going, hey. But I mean, and you know, I've I've done a lot of interviews lately, and every a lot of them go, you know, why did you stop doing the corporate worship thing? And I'm like, this is corporate yeah, worship. Yeah, yeah. To Tune me. Tune in. Yeah. You it's know? like, you know, <laughs> turn I, the dial. It's, it's interesting yeah. that in especially in worship music that if it doesn't sound like this or sound like that, then mm -hmm. it's not considered worship music mm -hmm. anymore. And uh, it's like we've lost, we've like lost the beauty of lyrics which is interesting yeah or the music of the earth yeah <laughs> it's like i mean it's well, worship is happening yeah. that's what we were even taught as kids if you grew up in church right that even the rocks yeah. will cry out that old idea that very kind of seemingly traditional kind of upbringing teaching i think is in fact very true and i think yeah. that's what you're speaking to is that the earth is actually in a posture of mm. worship will we join in yeah. you know I, I remember a friend of mine who grew up in church, very fundamental background, and so then had this, uh, had a specific hurt by a specific church, and that kind of sent him on a spiral in his spiritual um, leanings, I guess. He, he professed to not be a Christian for a long time, and then was trying to, I think just, I think he was trying to actually discover God. I think God had been dictated yeah. to him, trying to discover him. And I remember the Bible was kind of off limits for a while because it had been used in some toxic ways in his life. So he was just trying to discover God through the everyday. And yeah. he was um, married and very connected with his wife and his two kids. And and he would say, I mean, I sense there must be some kind of creator even just like looking into the eyes mm. of my dog, you know, much less my children and the relationship I have with my wife. So it seems as if corporate worship, something we've relegated to a genre, yeah. is perhaps really our entire life, you think? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> I'm so glad I pulled that out of your brain. <laughs> Do no, you? I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's not much to expound on that. It's it's, yeah. it's like one of those things that we can we yeah we can. we talk about it all day long. Mm -hmm. But it seems like we keep running in a circle. Yeah, it's like um, that's how it is to talk with me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Do you think that this will be your last season of waiting? Oh, probably not.
just me and no where I fall apart and when you soften my soul the hurt that's within and awaken these bones and bring life again 